Hello, everybody. I'm Enid Weitzelbaum, a member of the League of Women Voters of Rochester. I'd like to welcome all of you tonight, the candidates, the audience, and those viewing later at a later time to this forum sponsored by the League of Women Voters in Rochester. We'd also like to thank our generous partners of tonight's forum, the Rochester Post Bulletin, the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce, the Rochester Public Library, and RCTC for their help. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan volunteer organization organized at the local, state, and national level to encourage citizens to participate in government. While we as a League do study and take stands on issues, we never endorse or support political parties or candidates. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters in Rochester or any other partner or sponsor of this forum. And the sponsorship of the forum is not an endorsement of any candidate. It is our purpose in sponsoring this forum to provide you with an opportunity to hear candidates discuss face-to-face -face issues that are important to you. Tonight's questions have come from the League of Women Voters in Rochester, the Post Bulletin, and the Chamber of Commerce, and they will come from the members of our audience. As there's never enough time to co cover all the issues in a limited time and setting such as this, feel free to contact the candidates' campaign headquarters directly if your questions are not addressed tonight. We'd like to thank all candidates for running for office, for offering to serve your community, for the enormous time and dedication that, and commitment that running and serving demand. We encourage our members as individuals, as we encourage each of you, to get involved in your community and political party of your choice. All candidates who filed for office were invited to this forum. At least two candidates for any office must be available for the forum for us to put it on. Um, tonight's forum will be in three segments, and each will last approximately 35 minutes. Uh, we're going to begin tonight with the candidates for House Seat 25 A. Um, our candidates tonight are Dwayne Quam and John Bosson. Each candidate will have one minute to offer an opening statement. The candidates will then respond in turn to questions provided by the League of Women Voters Rochester this evening's partners, that is the Post Bulletin Chamber of Commerce and by the audience. Candidates will have one minute each to answer. The, an the candidates will then have one minute each to make a closing statement. I'd like to suggest to candidates that you make your answer as succinct as possible. It isn't necessary to use your entire minute for an answer, but please finish your sentence, but uh, please finish your sentence when, you're, no, when your time is up. We would like to cover as many questions as possible. Each candidate also has three rebuttal cards. These can be used at any point after the candidates have answered the question, but only one rebuttal card may be used per question, and your rebuttal is a 30-second opportunity to, re to uh, respond. The timekeeper tonight is a League of Women Voters Rochester volunteer, uh, student Alyssa Royak. Asking questions from the Post Bulletin will be Edie Grossfield, and from the Chamber of Commerce, Melissa Johnson. <laughs> um, the candidates have drawn numbers in, to determine the order in which they will speak, and Mr. Boston will begin with his opening statement. Uh, good evening. My name is John Boston, and I'm running for the House of Representatives in District 25A. Uh, just a short while ago this spring is where this journey all began. A couple weeks after my wife's birthday, she got to celebrate her birthday at the, the Dodge County Caucus this year, which was one of the best afternoons she's ever had. But uh, I hope to continue on my journey. Um, as an educator for 17 years, I see the barriers that our students are facing every year, and we need a legislature that will put quality education back in the forefront for the state of Minnesota. For the past two years, we've seen gridlock more than we ever have before, and the longest in the state's history. We need people that can work together and bring the state back. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. Thank you. I first want to welcome everybody for coming. Being an informed uh, voter and participant uh, helps this uh, republic uh, continue. I'm Dwayne Kwan. I grew up on a farm. I graduated from Byron High School, have degrees in engineering and physics. And uh, my wife, Pat, and I have uh, been married for 28 years with, with two sons. Now, I think that uh, government needs to return to being a partner with local government and also being 
a uh, servant of the people. And I think that uh, we need to continue the path of reforming government to return it to its original uh, intent. Thank you. Our first League of Women Voters question. And we will begin with Mr. Kwan. If the proposed constitutional amendment requiring all voters to show a photo or show a photo ID before voting passes in November, what rules would you propose to implement the language of the amendment in 2013? Well, I, I think the uh, Supreme Court in its decision and Justice Stevenson's uh, opinion for the majority sets down the uh, validity of utilizing uh, photo ID for the integrity of our electoral system and adding confidence. I know a lot of people with the close elections that we've had where you know, a statewide race is decided by a few hundred votes uh, want to have a little bit more integrity in the system. So I think basically you, you allow uh, federal and state government generated uh, IDs to be utilized to define a person's identity and you have other implements that would be uh, usable for defining residency. Thank you, Mr. Boston. Um, unfortunately, this amendment is out there for the people of Minnesota to vote for. The Republican-led majority spent way too much time working on these amendments instead of doing what we should have been doing, which is balancing the budget. The price that it's going to cost for local governments to run this and make sure that this goes well is into the millions of dollars. I agree that the local governments can handle this, but this is gonna put a lot of stress on the local governments and townships, and it's gonna cost the state of Minnesota more than it's worth. We are one of the leading states, and I think we're number one in voter fraud. We have no voter fraud. It's not been proven, it's not needed. It's been a waste of time. Thank you, do you have a rebuttal? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, basically, we spent 34% uh, of our time on the budget, uh, over 17% of our time on jobs, and 6% of the time on education. Less than 1% of the time was spent on uh, either one of the amendments. So I, I would I'd counter that we were over involved. I think the media spent a great deal of time on it, but not the legislature. Further rebuttal? Yes. Thank you. So our next question we'll offer to Mr. Boston first. What three steps would you propose to balance the budget? Balancing the budget's been one of the uh, biggest questions that I've received at the door this summer. We've been knocking on thousands of doors and had thousands of conversations with people wanting to balance the budget. And the people of the state have no idea how that's going to get done. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I got into politics. Uh, Running for office was not on my radar, but we need a state that can balance the budget and spend time creating jobs and spend time focusing on education funding and focus on helping up the middle class. We can balance the budget by working on these things together as a team and not in separate parties. We have separate parties, they both have ideas, but we need to come together to help create jobs, pay off our deficits, which we're going back to this January with another deficit. We don't have a surplus and we need to find ways to help the middle class and work on infrastructure. Thank you. Mr. Kwan? Well, basically jobs. I mean, by creating jobs, giving people employment, it helps everyone. It decreases the expenditures for the safety nets, but really helps our citizens to uh, be able to pay for things and keep our economy going. And that's, I think, the number one solution for the budget I believe we've made some good progress on that. But governmental reforms, looking at some of these programs that start out with great intent and then have morphed into sort of a wasteful area. So government reform and improving the job climate are the keys to helping Minnesota have a balanced budget. Any rebuttal? Our next question will come uh, from the Post Bulletin. We'll begin again with Mr. Boston. Hello. Um, the state still owes K-12 schools $2.4 in deferred payments. What do you think the timeline should be for paying that back, and where should the funding come from to do that? 
Every day that I've been out of the doors, knocking on the doors, seeing the students, seeing the children, seeing the families in the neighborhoods, I know how important it is to pay back our schools. Our schools are the foundation of our state, and our kids are our number one resource. And it's time that we start to empower them to succeed for a world-class economy instead of shortchanging them like we have every year. So in my opinion, we need to find a way to pay back our schools as quickly as possible without hurting the budget and without taking too much money out of the reserves uh, because that's not going to work. Uh, we need to find a way to pay back our schools so that our st students can compete on a global world economy. Uh, we need to find a way to do that in an equitable, predictable manner and find a funding formula, formula that funds schools across the state in an equal way so that all state Minnesota has as excellent of a chance as interstate schools like the Twin Cities areas. Thank you. Mr. Corman? Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, your, your data is incorrect. In fact, we've paid uh, about $400 million back already because of uh, higher projected uh, reserves. We filled up the rainy day fund, we filled up the cash flow account, and by statute and law, all the additional funds above that go back to paying back the shift, which has been around for many, many years, unfortunately. And that uh, governor proposed a 50-50 shift as part of a, a deal. We uh, didn't want to go that far, so we did agree to a increase of the shift by 10%, and the majority of that shift has already been paid back, and with the, uh, again, rosy uh, monthly uh, increases in what you know, he calls surplus, but additional funds than was planned for, uh, we're on track to pay back all of the additional shift and possibly a little bit more before the uh, budget period ends. Thank you, any rebuttal? Yeah. Um, not quite accurate. The Republican-led majority is still claiming to have a surplus. We don't have a surplus. We've taken about $3,000 on average per student away from our classrooms, and away from our uh, student teachers, and away from our districts. We need to find a way for this money to come back to pay the schools. So on the return in January, we've got to find a way to get this money back into the school systems, but I don't know where we're going to get it from. This has been some mythical, fictitious money that's suddenly occurred in the state legislature, and it's not there. Any other rebuttal? I have no clarification. We get three per... You get, you get three for the event. You each get three for the event. One per question. <laughs> uh, our next question comes from the Post Bulletin. Again, we'll begin with Mr. Quam. Uh, last session, the City of Rochester's number one priority was getting state funding to expand uh, Mayo Civic Center to add convention space. If elected, uh, re-elected, would you support these efforts? Why or why not? Well, I thought that their number one was the sales tax extension. But basically, the problem with the Mail Civic Center is that in the proposal, there was 10 to $11 million of maintenance. And it is really hard to go to representatives of the other districts and say, you know, we want this additional construction on a project that we haven't kept up our year-to-year -year maintenance on. I continually heard if you're you know, how should we give you more and expand that if you're not taking care of what you already have? And so I told the city leaders that you need to come up with a better proposal. You need to fund the uh, maintenance as it should be out of the uh, revenue from the existing taxes that are set aside for that activity. So I think it was a flawed proposal to begin with. I advised them to improve it, and it didn't make it. Thank you, Mr. Balsam. Uh, the Mail Civic Center project, to begin with, I also think wasn't a very successful uh, promotion. When the Viking Stadium came up, there were thousands and thousands of people at the state capitol talking to the legislators, explaining how important it is that people from the NFL come in and explain how important it is. But when it came time for the Mail Civic Center, there weren't enough people from southeast Minnesota up there. It just wasn't in the news enough. I'm from Caston, and I heard very little of it. But if we can improve the Mayo Civic Center from the condition that it's in now, it's going to improve a lot of things for the city. Jobs, 
lot of part-time jobs and changing to full-time jobs. And when we, things aren't the way they should be, when things are in disrepair, they need that money to keep that upkeep going. And hopefully we can avoid mistakes made in the past. Thank you. Any rebuttal? All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin with questions from the chamber. Our first question will go to Mr. Kwong. Would you support reducing maintenance of effort and unfunded mandates on local governments? And if so, are there any specific ones you would target? Um, basically, we, we did address some of those in the past session with, with reform bills and actually worked with the administration and agencies in order to do that. Uh, there are a lot of things that change over the decades. And unfortunately, many statutes uh, uh, don't update sufficiently. I, I would prefer to try and have an expiration date so you're forced to go back and look and improve it, each of the bills. Um, the county came up with a list of mandates, unfunded mandates, uh, and other uh, requirements that they wanted relief on. Uh, we uh, went through and added you know, specific ones but I think the most important one we did was allow schools uh, continued flexibility because they know what they ought to be able to do with their resources and one mandate uh, caused them to replace a retiring person with, sorry, out of time. Mr. Bossen. Um, this is one of the areas that I am going to learn more about at St. Paul, but like with most of the things that are going on in St. Paul right now, I don't think it's going very well. We need to focus and look at the inefficiencies of the state government and all the mandates and all the things that are going on with all the money at St. Paul and take a, make a detailed list of things that we need to change. Um, schools do have the opportunity right now to um, levy for money when they need it. And um, that was, I think, was supposed to be changed by a certain bill uh, to make it every other year. But our schools can't fund themselves and the schools have to go to the state, to the community to ask for money whenever they need money because they're improperly funded. Um, so we need to look at things, we need to fix things, and we need to uh, clean up St. Paul. Thank you, any rebuttal? All right, another question from the chamber will begin with Mr. Boston. We've talked about a variety of topics tonight. What would be your top priority if you were elected or re-elected? One of the top priorities is balancing the budget. We need to find a way to pay all our bills at St. Paul. Um, the last time I checked, uh, our checkbook wasn't balanced or our credit card bills weren't paid just because we sent in a minimum amount of money. We still have a balance. The state isn't taking care of our budget. We need to find the inefficiencies and focus on what things need to be fixed. And when we have that balance, the budget balance, then we can focus on properly funding our schools. Is the number one way to balance or to create jobs in our economy in this state is through education. We need to have an educated workforce, but we're not going to have the talented students that we have without properly funding our schools. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. Um, uh, just one little correction in that when we came in, there was no money left in the cash flow ready day fund, and now there are several hundred million dollars that's sitting there. So it should be a little easier to come up with a uh, budget solution. But my, my proposal that I'm looking at is again with jobs. There are a lot of economic development bills, programs that have gone through jobs, et cetera. And too frequently they have one community fighting against another for a business that's been located in Minnesota anyway. So I've been working with uh, staff to try and generate a bill that would allow for uh, in capitalization and loan program for companies that were going to do uh, business outside. In other words, grow the economy of the state of Minnesota, not just rehash or trade pieces of the pie, but actually do business outside the state, bring money in, and that way it'll help everyone in the state. Thank you. Any rebuttal? Next question comes from the audience. And I'm going to begin with Mr. Kwan with this question. If elected, how can you affect change that prevents a future state shutdown? Well, first of all, we had at least a half dozen bills to try and prevent a shutdown. 
after uh, we had the situation. We also were sitting on the floor, a bipartisan quorum was present on the floor of the House to try and, uh, you know, if we had an agreement, to try and prevent the shutdown. That didn't happen. Uh, hopefully we've learned that we uh, can effectively keep government running when you know the governor and the legislature uh, don't come to an agreement. So basically, I would set up a uh, funding uh, process that would allow all the government agencies to continue. Possibly, uh, I link some uh, you know projects, but not stopping a road project when you're in the middle of it. That didn't happen when they had previous shutdowns. Any highway MnDOT project in process was allowed to continue. Thank you, Mr. Boston. I think what it comes down to is collaboration and working together. I've been teaching for 17 years, and I was a student myself. And when you are in the classroom, you teach your kids to cooperate and work together and problem solve. And I don't think we're seeing enough of that in St. Paul. We have two separate parties, and they both have wonderful ideas. But just as we see in the federal government, we have, we've seen a wedge put between the process. We want to cooperate and we want to work with the Republicans, but they're making it very difficult. We need to have people on the floor at St. Paul that know how to bring people together and how to communicate and how to discuss these issues in a rational way. And we need to have people working on these things as one team. And I think I can be a voice of reason and start that in St. Paul. Thank you, any rebuttal? All right, our next question from the audience, we'll go with Mr. Boston first. Will you advocate for medical research or is there a need for regulations and or limits on medical research? Anything that we can do to help ease uh, ailments or illnesses or things that are causing the people of Minnesota is gonna be something that's very important. We'd have to look at the inefficiencies of things that are doing now, see if it's gonna hurt anyone, see if people will be protected in this research. Um, we need to look at all the scientific data that's arrived and when I get to St. Paul, we'll pour through the books, we'll look at all the information and we'll make an informed decision. Thank you. Mr. Kwan? Well, we need to leverage uh, Mayo, the University of Minnesota and its research partners <coughs> as they have with diabetes and other programs. Minnesota is a leader in the development of medical procedures, medical devices. Uh, we've got Medtronics and other companies out there. So I think we've done a great uh, job throughout the years of allowing and the fostering of our medical research and development. And so I, I think we need to continue along the lines that we already have been doing. Okay. Next question from the audience, we begin with Mr. Bossom. To what would you attribute voter interest or disinterest in this election? Well, interest, I'd like to say that it's because I'm running. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> disinterest is one of the biggest things, and I think you can agree with the mess that we've seen on TV between the federal governments. I think that's driving a lot of people away from the polls. And it could be adversely driving them to the polls. But at the doors this summer, people are tired of being told how to vote. And people are tired of being told to vote a certain way. People know what they want to do. People know what needs to be done. People already have their minds made up of who they're voting for, whether it's their party or whether it's their convictions. Um, we just hope that enough people show up this year uh, to make a difference and move Minnesota in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Corn. Um, actually, when I've been talking with people at the doors, I've been uh, amazed at how much more engaged people are. Uh, even though uh, four years ago we had, I believe, 82% uh, voter turnout in uh, Olmstead and Dodge counties, um, I think we might even surpass that. Uh, with the difficult times, a lot of people have woken up and have started to use the internet and other resources to become informed. And I think that uh, a lot of people are much more engaged and actively engaged as uh, look at the turnout here. Uh, two years ago, it was a much smaller room with fewer people. And I'm really, really pleased to see all the people that are willing to uh, 
give up part of their Monday nights to come and, and listen to this discussion. And I think it's the debate and the discussion, because uh, there's more than one side to almost everything, that helps come up with the best resolutions. Any rebuttal? Excuse me. Um, excuse me, another uh, question. What is the role, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to offer this to Mr. Quorum first. What is the role of the legislature in managing our water resources? Well, first of all, we need to set up a framework that is even and fair across the, uh, the state, but also takes into account that there are different regions, uh, ecological zones within the state of Minnesota. So not every area is identical. We also need to uh, get a partnership between the farmers and the state agencies in order, and, the, and the counties and the townships. And in order to foster that, I've had meetings with uh, MPCA to try and set up a independent review board so that if there is a question about something the agency does, uh, a farmer or a resident can go to this board with their, uh, you know, appeal. And I said, it's not because I think you're doing bad things, but it's because we need to get back that trust, that expectation that we can trust the agency, and I think this will help improve the trust. Thank you. Mr. <coughs> um, water is one of our most important resources in Minnesota. We go to Leech Lake every summer for one week, and we thoroughly enjoy our time up there, and we enjoy our time on the lake, we enjoy our time just relaxing and just getting away from it all, and to have that taken away or damaged in any way would be an atrocity. Uh, the water regulations that we've seen happening now, we need to make sure that all those things are done efficiently. If we can have local governments take control of this and work with the federal or with the state government, work with the legislature, I think we can come up with ways together to help protect our water systems. All the ecosystems that we have in the state are different. From the land up in Manorville and the Milton Township area, um, through the rest of our district, we need to make sure that everything is held accountable and we need to protect our environment as best we can. And hopefully we can do it together at a local and a state level. Thank you. Any rebuttal? Um, our next question from the audience will begin with Mr. Quam. And what is your view of aid to local governments? Have you noted any pros and cons associated with the program? Well, this is a prime example of a program with great intent that has morphed into um, a less uh, effective program. With about 36% of all the revenues going to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth, uh, I think that the program needs to be fixed. First of all, this program is to help local government that did not have a tax base in order to be able to fund basic core um, services. Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth have huge tax bases and they should not be receiving mul mul many times the per capita funding in LGA. If you cut that back to 18%, they would still be about average with the rest of the uh, municipalities, but you would be able to allow for a huge increase in LGA to the cities and the uh, entities that it was originally intended for. This is just another example of we need to return to original intent. Thank you. Mr. Bosson? Uh, the local government aid formula in general, it's, it's outdated. It needs to be fixed, along with a lot of the other things in St. Paul that need to be fixed. Uh, most of the money does go to the urban areas. Uh, they have a higher population, they have a higher crime rate, they have more, and I don't want to say more, because they're larger, they have a lot more needs, but it's not fair that they receive that much more money than upstate Minnesota. So if we can look at the formula and tweak it and fix it and change it so that it's more effective, it's gonna be a benefit to the whole state so that we are all on the same level playing field. Any more um, We're gonna take our last question from the audience prior to closing statements. Uh, this question will begin with Mr. Boston. What will you do to address the growing number of people at risk of becoming homeless? When you turn on the television and see people 
in the news that are going through downtimes and are losing their homes, whether it's because they had to move out of their homes because of high property taxes or loss of a job or for whatever reason, it makes your heart ache. We need to find a system that can help people recover faster or quickly, find ways to train them or retrain them for a job that they used to have that they could also still do. Uh, we need to reach our hand out to help people, but we need to focus on making them become efficient themselves. And we don't want people to rely on money and help from the state forever. We want people to grow up and take up on their own, just like we do in a classroom. We want people to be able to fend for themselves. But if they need help from the state, we need to be there. Mr. Bowman? I think we actually have to go out and have the agency people with uh, uh, leaders in the community uh, speak and meet with the people that need the services. Again, we need to revamp these uh, programs in order to do a better job. Uh, something that maybe worked uh, 20, 30 years ago um, might not work now. The types of jobs, the types of uh, uh, activities and needs are different. And so we really need to look at uh, engaging the community and engaging the people that uh, require the services and come up with a better solution so that, again, reform and improve government. Thank you, any rebuttal? All right, well, that concludes the questions portion of our forum. We're going to go next to the closing statements from our candidates, for which there will be no rebuttal opportunity. Um, and uh, by the drawing of numbers, Mr. Kwame will go first. Well, again, thank you for coming. This is the very room where I got the idea for my uh, first bill, uh, there was a union meeting here of faculty, and they were talking about, you know, we have to do a committee to find out a way to spend the money that's left, or we lose it. And boy, it'd be nice if we could spend some of our, you know, settle that money on what we think would work best. So I had a bill to empower the people that are involved with uh, fiduciary responsibility. You save the money, Half the savings goes back to the state. The other half stays with you, and you get to pick how to spend it. That bill, my first bill, passed 184 to 6. Uh, I had another bill to improve. There's emergency medical services. That passed 186 to nothing. Uh, I've had uh, 17 chief authored bills that were co-sponsored by Democrats. And there's only one Democrat that's got a more bipartisan voting record than myself. Thank you, Mr. Boson. Um, I would like to take an opportunity to thank everybody that is here this evening and thank, uh, there's several people here that have helped me through this process and helped me learn the process of being a future representative. My name's John, and I want to be your voice in St. Paul. I want to speak for the voters of the district and I want to work for things that matter to our state. I want to work on issues that are important to the voters of our district, for the people of all of our small town communities in Southeast Minnesota. And I believe I can be a stronger voice for our state of Minnesota and stand up for the people that I work with, people that I go to church with, and people that I've known for years. Um, some of you have known me for a long time, some of you have trusted me for just from the beginning of this process, but I'm asking anyone in here to trust me one more time and trust me as your state representative on November 6th. And I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you. Thank you to both of our candidates. Thanks for participating tonight and uh, uh, being so honest with us. Before we begin the next statement, uh, the next segment of our forum,